Okay, so we are now recording this session. Uh, good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, October the 5th. Welcome to our first Aperio Teaching and Learning conference call of this month. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and along with Neil Caden and Tricia Gordon, I'll be facilitating this conversation today. We are so excited to have Patrick Smith from Texas State University, who will be talking about his Atlas Award-winning presentation for social psychology. So welcome, Patrick. We're so glad that you could be here with us. Before we dive in and talk about Patrick's presentation, a couple of logistical notes. First, please don't forget to sign in on the Etherpad. The link to the Etherpad is in the chat window. So please don't forget to click that link and sign in. Thank you to Tricia, who has volunteered to take some notes for our meeting today which I always really appreciate because that multitasking is always overwhelming for my tiny brain. So thanks so much, Tricia, for volunteering to do that. Before we dive into Patrick's presentation, if we have people who are project leads or project reps on the call who want to give some updates, I would assume that Neil, at the very least, has probably got some updates. So anyone with project updates, we would love to hear those. So go ahead. So I should go ahead. Sounds hello. great, Neil. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so let's see, give you the latest uh, from around the town. Um, hi, Tricia. Uh, let's see. So Sakai, um, we're working on Sakai 11.2. We're expecting to have our first release candidate by hopefully this afternoon there were still some some issues that were fixed and QA tested and needed merging so hopefully by this afternoon which means we'd be a bit ready for doing testing QA testing starting tomorrow we have a QA test plan and um, QA has been kind of light lately I think people have been really consumed with back to back to school work so we could really use a bump in uh, QA effort especially to work on the 11.2 maintenance release um, we're trying to get that out by the end of October, so October 28th. Um, so that's one announcement, uh, Sakai 11.2 maintenance release. And then we're looking at an 11.3 maintenance release, probably uh, January-ish of 2017, because there's going to be some additional uh, fixes that are coming. Uh, there's some work going on for Turnitin which is the plagiarism detection tool a number of Sakai schools use. And the uh, integration for that, I understand, you know, it's been undergoing a metamorphosis for a while, but it's still not ready in time for, 11, for the 11.2 maintenance release, so it will likely be in the 11.3 maintenance release. And then we're going to have some discussions starting uh, pretty soon um, on what should go into Sakai 12. And we're looking at kind of a smaller Sakai 12 than, than how big and huge the Sakai 11 release was um, and releasing it more quickly. And uh, so that's that's the status of releases. So any any questions or thoughts on that before I announce a couple other things? Okay. So a couple other things. Um, we are. It looks like the dates for Sakai Camp. Uh, it's going to be in Orlando again this year, uh, this coming year, and. Uh, the dates probably are January. I sent out a hold that date a week or two ago, and it looks like um, the community is settling on uh, January 21st through the 25th, where the um, that's Saturday through Wednesday. Where at the moment the the actual activity dates are Sunday the 22nd for a team building exercise, uh, which was a lot of fun last, uh, earlier this year, and um, two full days of meetings on um, Monday and Tuesday. So I recommend that you use Saturday and Wednesday as uh, um, travel days. It's possible there might be something social going on on Saturday, but I'm not sure yet. And uh, that's kind of where things stand. Uh, so we had a really nice turnout. We have, it's, a, it's a time for the community to get together and focus exclusively on Sakai. Um, earlier this year when we did it, we launched the Sakai Marketing Group. We had a renew and invigorated um, Sakai QA effort. We uh, made some really um, hard and fast goals and a lot of commitment to getting Sakai 11 out. Um, so it just uh, created a lot of great momentum in the community and we're hoping um, doing this again, we'll, we'll have the same result. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, so 
let's see. Uh, that's all I can think of for the moment. Um, there's some work going on on a Perio farm, which is the funding and resource uh, management where we're trying to find uh, easier ways for all Aperio projects to do fundraising for um, enhancements to their projects. Um, so that's that's making some progress. Um, I can't think, oh, I think of anything else other than, uh, no, I think that's about it, unless anybody else can think of something they want an update on. There's probably other stuff, but that's all that's coming to my mind for the moment. The only other thing that I can think of, Neil, is I don't see Wilma on the call today, but I did see some emails yesterday that a tentative schedule for Sakai Virtual Conference has been set, so I don't know if you might want to say something about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sakai Virtual Conference and probably remind people about Open Aperio as well. So, yes, yeah, Sakai Virtual Conference is November 2nd, uh, full day. Um, the schedule, we had a lot of great proposals, um, and uh, the schedule for that is set. Um, it's going to be six concurrent sessions online, uh, and you can register starting today. If you're a presenter, you should be either have received or should be receiving very soon a confirmation that, that your proposal for presentation has been accepted. And I believe that presenters get a little bit of a discount on the registration cost. And all of the registration uh, money goes towards um, goes towards Sakai. We end up with a, with a nice little fund uh, at the end based on how many people sign up and uh, then figure out how to use that to improve and better Sakai. Um, and uh, Wilma could probably talk better about it, but there is a great website, uh, vertconf at aperio.org, so I'll paste that in, which talks about the keynote speakers. We have a panel discussion to kick off the event. We've got um, New York University doing a presentation at the end uh, to as the final keynote. Um, there's uh, prizes, there's a rogues gallery, which is a lot of fun where you can post information about yourself and be playful with it to kind of um, connect with other people in the community. Um, so a lot of good stuff there. I'll paste it in the chat and in the, oh, somebody's already typed it in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that is the, let me just see here. Any other major things about the Sakai Virtual Conference? Um, the, the, the panel discussion is on Sakai, the idea of a, a next generation of uh, LMS and you know, kind of brainstorming where, where Sakai should head in terms of being innovative. Um, and that's the opening panel discussion. The closing discussion, as I mentioned, is New York University and kind of their experience with Sakai and why Sakai is important to them. And a lot of really, really good presentations in between those. Um, and that also reminds me to mention uh, Open Aperio, which um, we're getting a head start on planning this year for Open Aperio. Uh, so if you have ideas for proposals for Open Aperio, you can start getting them in right now as well. And that way we'll be able to build a program. One of the challenges we've had in the past with Open Aperio is we get started a little late and it makes people it makes it difficult to develop the program, which then it makes it difficult for people to make a decision if they want to plan um, to come to Open Aperio. Um, and just a couple of logistics about Open Aperio. It's in Philadelphia next year, and it is, what are the dates here? Uh, June 4th through June 8th in, in Philly at the Sheridan uh, Philadelphia Society of Talents. Really, from what I understand, a, convenient, a really super convenient location uh, within Philly. So it should be a, a lot of fun. And um, hopefully we'll get that, uh, the program set up a bit earlier so people can make a decision to come. Um, that's right, thanks Dave. So I think that's all I've got. I'm probably forgetting some other things too. <laughs> I probably need to make notes before the meeting. Um, well, it's a sign that there's a lot of good stuff going on, which is always a really good thing. There is. There's a lot going on. So thanks, Neil, for all of those updates. For those of you who have not participated in either virtual conference or ever had the opportunity to attend Open Aperio, I got the opportunity to do virtual conference for the first time last fall. And I've now been to a couple different Open Aperio meetings, and all of those were really, really valuable. And 
left me feeling really energized about everything going on in the community and all the possibilities for collaboration within my own school and with other schools for all kinds of cool projects. So I really encourage you guys to get involved with both of those. Virtual conference is not particularly expensive. Um, it's just an opportunity to hear some really, really great sessions without having to go to all the trouble and hassle of traveling somewhere. So I would definitely encourage you guys to get involved in both of those things if you can. And if you have any questions about those, feel free to reach out to Neil or to Wilma Hodges, who is chairing the proposal committee for virtual conference. They're both awesome and can respond to whatever questions you might have. Wilma's awesome. I'm just okay, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Neil has to say that because he's a really humble guy, but he's actually amazing and the guy who keeps the whole community going, so we'd be lost without him. <laughs> and Trisha agrees in the chat. She agrees that Neil is definitely awesome, in all caps, so it must be true. Any other project reps or project leads who want to make any comments about any other Aperio or Sakai projects before we dive into our main presentation today? Feel free to come on the mic or type in the chat. Okay, going, going, gone. So at this point, I think we're going to hand things over to Patrick Smith from Texas State University, who is going to give us a presentation about his Atlas Award-winning uh, social psychology site. So take it away, Patrick, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Matt. I, I did tell Matt that I wanted to turn my webcam on just at the beginning. I, I like kind of getting that uh, facial recognition so you see that there is a person over here um, at the beginning of the presentation, but I'll turn it off here in a second because... This is me. You know what I look like, and I'll save you some bandwidth. Um, but I did want to thank everyone for being here today, and I wanted to thank uh, Louisa also for approaching me with the opportunity to uh, be able to join in for this session. Um, and I will go ahead and bring up my presentation now. And I am still learning Big Blue Button a bit, so give me one second while I do that. We were successful this morning in the test, though, so I have faith. All right. I believe that's working. Yes, Matt? That is working, Patrick. You're good to go. Fantastic. All right. So um, the presentation that I'll do today and the course I want to talk to you about is a course that my best friend and colleague and I had the pleasure to work together on, um, in which we took a um, online social psychology course, and we added game elements to that course to try to make the online discussion part of that course more engaging. Um, your sort of key presenters today, first of all, me, I'm Patrick Smith. I'm the Assistant Director of Learning Experience Design here at Texas State University, and actually the director of our uh, team is Ann Jensen, who's also logged in to uh, Big Blue Button with us this morning. No pressure, by the way, Ann, thank you for having your boss watch you do the presentation. I appreciate you being here. Um, unfortunately, the person who you won't get to meet today, like I said, is my best friend, my colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Nagurney. Uh, he's an instructor of psychology at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. I know, poor guy. Uh, he would have liked to have been here, but it is just after four o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time, so that was a tough sell. Uh, so he's letting me do the presentation today. Uh, the parts that talk about psychology, I will try to get through the best I can without him being here, but uh, if there are any psychologists in the room, please forgive uh, any mistakes that I make. <laughs> so the main question that when Alex and I started working together on this project that we wanted to ask is really, is there a better way? Is there a better way of approaching online discussions to make them more engaging for our students? We all know, everyone in this room knows that discussion is an important part of online courses to help build community, to help um, you know, get that experiential nature to learning. So why do students seem to treat online discussions like busy work so much of the time? 
Um, three things that kind of motivated the beginning of us working together on, on this project. One, like I said, uh, Alex and I are very good friends and we do talk a good bit about the courses that he's teaching. And one thing that I was seeing in Alex's courses, and you may see this in some of the courses that you've dealt with before, if I zoom in on his uh, forums here, we noticed that a lot of times at the beginning of the semester, you know, our forums are pretty robust. Students are, uh, you know, responding, they're active, they're engaged. But then as I kind of move down here, you're going to notice that we go from 40 messages to this slow and steady decline all the way toward the end of the course where we end up with 13 messages total for a forum. So we were seeing this kind of steady decline in the level of engagement um, that students seem to give to online discussions over a period of time in a course. And we wanted to find a way to make that more engaging. Um, another thing that sort of happened around that time, oh, I forgot I had the Zooms in there. <laughs> another thing that happened around that time was I had the pleasure of attending the GLS, the Games Learning and Society Conference in Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the founders of GLS, uh, Constance Steinkuhler, was doing um, sort of a, a keynote talk at that conference. And one of the things that she said uh, was really a call for more cross-curricular work between uh, instructional designers and game developers and people like psychologists. She specifically said, you know, where are the psychologists in this field? You know, we need to bring them in. We need to get them engaged with us so that we can use their knowledge to help design more engaging learning uh, environments for students and, and you know, especially bring in that gameful side and look at the psychology of gaming. And it just so happened that I know a psychologist very well. So I thought, well, this may be a good uh, seed for a project to begin. So being the instructional designer that I am, um, I started looking, <laughs> any instructional designers in the room may remember this uh, chart. This is uh, from Maker and Pipe, analyzing performance problems. Um, started looking at this issue of the levels of engagement in online discussions from a systematic way. Uh, Alex and I sat down together and we started to look to see, you know, where is the problem? Uh, you know, is the problem in you know, the, the content? Is the problem in the way it's being delivered? Is the problem in the motivation of the students to be engaged in these discussions? Uh, we started to look at this in a systematic way and we did start to see the levels of motivation uh, being an issue. And as a social psychologist, uh, that's something that's very interesting to Alex. So we decided to try adding game elements to this social psychology class to see if we could make it more motivating for students to be engaged in online discussions. Now, uh, as I was uh, saying as well to Matt this morning, I am notorious for talking for every bit of time that I'm allowed. So these next few slides, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. However, I will give you the link to this Prezi um, at the end of the presentation. So if any of these statistics and data you're about to see are of interest to you, you can certainly uh, go back and find them. I do like to talk a little bit though about the demographic. Um, knowing who the gaming audience is. The uh, ESA, the Entertainment and Software Association, uh, each year puts out data and statistics about basically the gaming community in general. Um, looking at numbers and things like the fact that 155 million Americans consider themselves gamers. They actively play video games. And you can see the um, statistics there for those who own consoles. Uh, the amount of time spent playing these games, you know, three plus hours every week, four out of five homes having devices used primarily for gaming, and the ages as well. Um, a lot of times I know we think of a stereotypic gamer as being uh, younger and male, but you see here that the average U.S. gamer, 35 years old, 26% um, being under 18, but 30% being between 18 and 35, and the demographic about, uh, you know, the, the gender spread as well, 50 cent 56% male, 44% female. So a lot of times when we think of gamers, we have that stereotypical view, but the data actually shows us that there is a widespread of people in our country that consider themselves gamers. So we have a good uh, sort of reach into the demographic there. Um, as for the role that those games are playing, uh, one thing that I was interested in seeing in this data is, you know, are the gamers, the folks that are playing out there, you know, what is the level of socialization that's going on 
in those games. Uh, and we found that 39% of frequent gamers do play social games. So they like the social engagement being involved uh, in that aspect. And of course, that's important if we're looking at sort of adding these game elements to a social psychology course and to discussions uh, in general, of course. Um, Gamers playing around six and a half hours per week socially. And interestingly, they interact with their friends in real life on average five hours per week. So, you know, these hardcore social gamers are actually spending more time with their friends online in these gaming environments than they are actually seeing them in the face to face format. And if you look at the data about social connection here, I found it really interesting that, um, you know, of course, these gamers are playing with their friends, but also more and so with their family members, uh, some with parents, with spouses, partners, and this data about this feeling of connection uh, that, you know, games can help them feel more connected to their friends and their families, which is really great and really powerful. So, uh, and this part, I, I will try to get through my the best without Alex, but uh, I'll let you know that he would explain it better than I. Um, the psychology of motivation and gaming is the next thing that we really discussed and we wanted to make sure that we had a firm footing in. Um, if we wanted to add these motivating elements to this course, this was going to be really the keystone that we wanted to build off of. So it's important, I think, uh, at the very beginning to help us sort of uh, distinguish between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation the way that I think it's easiest to remember that is, you know, extrinsic. These are things that are external. They're coming from an external source uh, to provide motivation. So, for example, things as simple as getting that gold star on your paper or getting that nice big A circled, uh, you know, getting the good grade. Uh, from, you know, if you think of it from a sports point of view, uh, playing the sport and getting your motivation by being able to wear that medal or being able to hold up that trophy. You know, these are extrinsic, you know, physical motivators that are kind of, like I said, external uh, to the person who's actually playing the sport. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with this one as well. Uh, money can be, is uh, very extrinsically motivating. And even something as simple as, you know, having a coworker tell you, hey, you're awesome, or having anyone tell you that you're awesome, that pat on the back, even though it's not something that you can take to the bank and spend, it's still an extrinsic motivator. It's something that came from outside of you that motivated you to, uh, to do something. Now, on the other side of that, we have intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation is sort of this holy grail. Uh, you know, we, we know extrinsic motivators. We know the types of things that we can do to try to motivate people to perform or to try to take certain actions. Um, the tough thing about extrinsic motivation is it's not as sustainable. Um, you know, psychology has told us that, you know, using extrinsic motivators, generally you have to provide more and more of those extrinsic motivators to get the same output from the person who you're trying to motivate. Intrinsic motivation, though, the great thing about this is it comes from inside the person. Basically, the, uh, you can generate your own. You're like a perpetual motion machine. You can generate your own intrinsic motivators. So for example, playing sports, instead of playing sports to be able to hold that trophy up over your head or put that medal on your chest, playing sports because you enjoy the sport, because you enjoy the camaraderie, you enjoy the challenge perhaps, the, the feeling that that gives you is what motivates you. Um, doing things like puzzles, you know, these are games as well. A lot of times when people say that they don't identify as being a gamer, I ask how many of them play things like Sudoku and of course hands go up and then, yeah, yes, you are a gamer. Absolutely you are. Um, and you're probably not paid <laughs> to complete these Sudoku puzzles. Uh, you do it because you enjoy the challenge because uh, that's something that, you know, intrinsically motivates you. It, it gives you that pleasure of being able to defeat that. Now, myself, uh, I am a, a bit of a cook, so uh, I kind of threw this example up there of um, creative outlets. So people have these you know, creative interests that uh, give them satisfaction from being able to do this, to be able to express themselves and whatnot. And we ask the question, are gamers intrinsically motivated? Oh, yes. Gamers are very intrinsically motivated. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you see the the 
guy up at the top here. Um, the expression that he's showing in this picture is what game designers, uh, and actually Jane McGonigal and uh, her books was kind of the first one to bring this into the public knowledge, but what game designers call the feeling of fiero. It is an Italian term uh, that basically means triumph. So the feeling basically when you've come up against a challenge that has really pushed you to your limits, but you succeed in that challenge, that may be the face that you make, especially if you're playing a video game, you know, a controller in one hand and the fist in the other hand. Uh, that feeling is one of the heights of intrinsic motivation of being challenged and being able to defeat that challenge. Now, uh, as I said earlier, I am a bit of a cook myself, so I always think, you know, if I'm going to make something, I need to know the ingredients. So if I was going to add these levels of intrinsic motivation to a course, I kind of wanted to know what the ingredients are of motivation, and really comes down to one main ingredient. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in the room knows what this is. I think when I was actually at NYU for Open Aperio, there were a few people in the room that uh, raised their hand. They immediately recognized this. This is dopamine. And dopamine is a, a chemical that is released in the brain when pleasurable activity takes place and it activates that pleasure drive inside your brain. Other chemicals get involved like serotonin, norepinephrine, but the dopamine channel is really the first step uh, when you basically take something on that you find enjoyable. Um, and do we love our dopamine? Oh yes, we love our dopamine. As you can see, people are, are very dedicated to it. So again, thinking back to that extrinsic or intrinsic motivation. For extrinsic motivation, think of it this way. Someone else is having to give you your dopamine. Intrinsic motivation, you're making your own dopamine. And that it would be the perfect place if we could find for our students to be able to you know, format these discussions and these sort of learning interactions in a way that are challenging for them and that they find uh, motivating and engaging enough that it becomes this pleasurable experience that they want to be engaged in. All right, so it's hard to talk about uh, motivation at all, be it extrinsic, intrinsic, without talking about uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, he is a Hungarian psychologist, and um, the thing that he is probably most known for in his research is uh, his um, what he calls his flow channel. So if I kind of come over to this graphic here, um, this is what Csikszentmihalyi sort of came up with in his research when he looked at levels of engagement and levels of skill. So for example, if we look down here in the bottom left hand corner, um, the challenge level on the left side, the skill level at the bottom. So if a student has a low level of skill with something, but they're given a low level of challenge, then the feeling that they're probably going to reflect that, that would be pretty apathetic. However, if they have a low level of skill, but the challenge starts to rise, well, then they're going to worry because they don't have the skill to be able to achieve the challenges that are being sent their way. And finally, at the top here, a high level of challenge and low level of skill is going to cause anxiety. Now, you can kind of follow that idea around the screen, but if you look up here in the top right-hand corner, this idea of a high level of challenge paired with a high level of skill, so students being highly skilled but also being challenged, you know, at a very high skill level, um, can basically the person can achieve what Csikszentmihalyi calls the flow effect. And uh, I'll use his words because his words are much more, uh, you know, uh, better written than mine. Um, he said that flow is being completely involved in the activity for its own sake. The ego falls away, time flies. Every action, movement, and thought flows from previous to the next. Your whole being is involved using your skills to their utmost level. Now, uh, Csikszentmihalyi uh, uses the example in his original research of jazz musicians, uh, basically musicians who are um, on the spot really composing music. They're improvising this music. Very, very challenging, but uh, the good ones are very good at it. And when they kind of fall into this uh, ability, they achieve flow. Some of them would even um, describe as getting tunnel vision and as time just flying by, uh, you know, without them even taking note. Uh, 
Now, another example that I was thinking of when I was reading through this research, and I, this is a media clip, uh, which I don't think will present very well over Big Blue Button. Um, but basically, <laughs> what you would be seeing here, a YouTube clip of uh, line cooks at a busy restaurant during a Friday night dinner rush. And it's a time-lapse photography, uh, time-lapse video. And basically what you would see is people who are never stopping, always moving, um, very good at what they're doing, and they basically get into that flow channel. Um, you know, they don't have to think about what they're doing, and uh, you know, the time is just flying by. Now, do gamers achieve flow? Oh yes, gamers definitely achieve flow. Um, now, I, I don't see the big blue button window right now, but um, I generally would ask my audience, you know, how many gamers we have in the audience. So I'll ask you that rhetorically. Um, but think of, of yourself, you know, be you a gamer or be it anything that you you know, find enjoyable, that you're skilled at, and that you like the challenge of. When you're engaged in that activity, how many times have you began the activity, and then maybe it feels like half an hour goes by, and you look at the clock, and it's four hours later. I know that happens to me all the time when I'm playing a video game that I really am engaged with. I'll think, oh, yeah, I'll get in half an hour tonight before bedtime. And then next thing I know, I look at the clock and it's one o'clock in the morning. So, and if you see me coming in some mornings with one eye closed, that's probably generally why that's happening. Um, so yes, gamers definitely achieve this, uh, this flow channel. And that is the optimum place for them to be to, um, you know, in, using that intrinsic motivation. Uh, the flow channel is a very pleasurable place to be. It's a place where you're challenged at your maximum skill level and you are able to achieve and basically overcome those challenges. So some of the statements here uh, that I have at the bottom, um, I can't wait to play Dragon Age Inquisition when I get home. I feel so powerful in that game. That's great. You know, that shows that that student and that player is, you know, they feel powerful. They feel engaged when they're uh, in that activity. Or I'm so stoked my team is going to attempt the Vault of Glass on hard mode tonight. We're unstoppable when we're together. Again, that team camaraderie. You contrast those with the final statement of I can't, I can't wait to finish my homework so dad will finally let me get back to Witcher 3. Well, we want the homework <laughs> to be the thing that is as engaging and as uh, challenging, but also enjoyable for the student, if we can, as that video game. So that was our goal. Um, quickly, just going through this, uh, we talk a little bit about self-determination theory. And self-determination theory, uh, focusing on this first three levels of basically giving a person autonomy uh, allowing them to achieve competence and then showing them relatedness. Those three things are what we wanted to focus on to um, you know, build engagement here. So what we did, uh, basically, well, I'll tell you what we did in a second, but games address those first three uh, elements of self-determination theory by giving the player choices and control over how objectives are completed or how the storyline unfolds. So that's the autonomy part. Um, it allows the player to build their skill set to be able to accomplish their objectives. So that allows them to build competence. And also, um, it allows them to come together and play cooperatively to achieve a goal, to give them that relatedness. OK, so uh, that is all I'll talk about with psychology, because like I said, um, Alex can say it much better than I can. So at this point, you're thinking, so what? Guy, tell us what you did in this course. Stop talking about psychology. So that's what I'll do now. Um, now, I've watched enough HGTV to know that it's important to give a good before picture if you're going to show a remodel on something. So I wanted to give you a before picture of Psychology 322. Uh, psychology 322 is a social psychology course. It's taught at the undergraduate level. It is a fully online course, um, and the University of Hawaii caps that course at 45 students. So it is a pretty large online course. Um, before Alex and I collaborated on this, basically the content was delivered completely via the textbook and his assessments were uh, basically taken from quizzes, from discussions. Uh, he had students do short essays and exams. And actually, if I kind of zoom in on the uh, before shot of his course site in Kai, uh, you'll see basically the way he set it up was in you know, week one, they would have a chapter um, reading assignment, discussion, question, quiz. Reading assignment, discussion, question, short paper. Reading assignment, discussion, question, quiz. <laughs> so you can kind of see the consistency that's built there. Um, and this is how the course was designed, more or less. 
Um, and this is the course, by the way, that I showed you the screenshots of at the beginning with the forums that started out being, you know, relatively decently engaging. And then by the end of the course, there was a, a large drop off uh, in the engagement level of the students. So um, that was the before shot. So talking a little bit about our approach and what we uh, wanted to achieve here. Uh, we added a few different things to the course to try to, first of all, increase the level of connection between Alex and his students. Um, so this first thing we wanted to make it a bit more personalized to the students uh, to help build those elements of student to instructor connection because the course was lacking that a bit. Um, some of the things we added, we did add uh, an instructor introduction video where Alex introduced himself to his students, not introduced the course, but really just introduced himself and let the students get to know him as a person a little bit better. Um, we also added video mini lectures. Uh, so these were short, generally eight to 12 minute uh, lecture snips that uh, Alex would record sort of on his own there in his office, where he would cover the most important points of the uh, content that were being delivered that week. And it also gave him a chance to share some uh, experiential information with his students as well. And the one that I forgot to talk about there, the Ask Dr. Nagurney forum. So we did uh, put that in, and that was kind of a general questions form where the students could go in and ask questions about the course in general, nothing personal about grades or whatnot, but just um, general questions, not only to allow them to connect uh, with Alex a little bit better, but also what we found at University of Hawaii and here at Texas State, we do this as well, is that, you know, having students uh, be able to ask those general course questions in a public forum, a lot of times their classmates will actually answer them before the instructor gets a chance to. So then it builds that sort of student to student uh, relationship as well, which is great. So. Uh, the next thing we wanted to add were elements of collaboration and socialization. And the courses that previously existed, the students really worked uh, on their own the entire time. There was no collaborative or um, cooperative learning. So we wanted to add some elements to kind of build that student to student connection. Uh, one of the things that we added uh, on the sort of the proof of concept version was an introduction form. And uh, the introduction form, <laughs> The song was popular at the time, uh, First Let Me Take a Selfie, and that's actually what we titled our introduction form. It was sort of the students' chance to introduce themselves. Um, the first time we ran the course, the students actually said, you know, I hate selfies. I hate to take selfies. So I don't want to post a selfie of myself. And I was like, sure you do. I've... <laughs> I've been around students here at Texas State and I've gotten a chance to visit Alex plenty of times. I've seen plenty of those students taking selfies, but uh, they said they didn't want to. So the second time we ran the course, we actually used an idea that uh, an instructor here at Texas State, I had seen them use, where instead of asking the students to post pictures of themselves, we invited them to post pictures of their pets so that we could sort of get to know them better through the pets rather than just seeing pictures of them. And let me tell you what, that forum exploded. We got pictures of pets and pets and pets. Actually, and this photograph was a collage that one student posted. These are all her pets, so she, <laughs> she has quite a few. Um, so the students loved this idea. They loved sharing the pictures of the animals and getting to know each other through the animals that they had and whatnot. So that was uh, very successful. Uh, so the introduction form, uh, we did add team-based assignments as well. Uh, the teams were not self-select. The rosters were assigned by the instructors. The teams were assigned by Alex. Um, and we did add the team discussions, a team project, and a team charter. And this is something that uh, we have found to be very effective in the past. The team charter assignment actually is done at the very beginning of the semester, right after the team is formed. And we ask the teams to come up with team goals, sort of the team norms, if you will, um, a communication plan so that they come together and talk about, since it is a fully online course, how they're gonna communicate with one another, what technologies they're going to use if they wanna meet synchronously, for example, and they can get that figured out up front. 
Uh, we asked them to come up with a conflict management plan, which we found very successful as well. Uh, and we do tell them in the instructions that uh, the first step of your conflict management plan cannot be to get the instructor involved. We want the teams to really start to own that teamwork process themselves and to try to figure out ways to work through conflict before they engage the instructor right off the bat. Getting the instructor involved is always a step in the conflict management plan, but we always tell them not to make it the first step. And finally, uh, give, letting them choose a team name for themselves so that they can start to form that sort of identity and camaraderie. So a few things that we added for that aspect. Now, getting into the discussions, which is really what we uh, focused on for those levels of engagement and also for our um, game elements. So following research about discussions in general, we knew we wanted to make the discussions personally meaningful, very important for our adult learners. Um, we wanted them to be structured. We wanted them to be collaborative. We wanted them to be evidence-based as well, not just opinion-based. We wanted to have students actually, uh, you know, kind of giving us information that was um, uh, empirical in nature, and also the idea of tying it to some sort of a deliverable. So we wanted to keep those in mind. From the game design side of the table, um, we used some research about game design saying that um, to make things successful and to make them engaging and motivating, we wanted the students to operate within a narrative. So basically we wanted to give them a storyline or a story arc that would evolve throughout the semester. So uh, we're creating this game with a story in mind. We wanted to give them that feeling of autonomy so that they would have choice in how things unfold, uh, a range of skills, that they would need to solve the encounter. We wanted to have cooperative and player versus player mode. So we wanted them to work cooperatively, but we also wanted to uh, enter in the possibility that students could um, compete with one another because competition is motivating for some types of gamers. And we wanted to provide achievements for successful performance. So here is what we did. Here is how the game is played. Um, Step one, the students are introduced to Patrick. And Patrick may look familiar to you. Um, Patrick is a character that the students are introduced to early in the semester. And Patrick is, as he says, he works for the student affairs office at a university in Texas. And he is a friend of Dr. Nagurney's and he knows that Dr. Nagurney is teaching social psychology and basically uh, Patrick's University is having some problems. There are some issues on campus that could probably be solved through interventions of different types of social psychology. So Patrick is reaching out to these students asking for help, um, basically <laughs> begging at some points for help from these students to try to figure out how to address some of these social issues that his campus is facing. Now between you and I, uh, what we did actually was uh, Alex had basically gave me a list of social issues that were taking place at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. <laughs> so uh, like I said, we wanted to make it relevant to the students. So these were all actually issues that were taking place uh, on his campus, but we just had this character that they're meeting saying more or less that they're taking place on his campus, uh, on the character's campus instead. Now, interestingly, I have to share with you, um, I, I've been very lucky. It's it's difficult to have your best friend move 3,000 miles away, but it's also that nice to have a friend in Hawaii. And I have gotten to visit Alex a number of times. And while this course was running, I actually, for the first time, I did get to go out and visit him. And it's a small campus. Um, and more than one time, one time in particular, um, one of his students ran up to me as we were walking across the quad and recognized me from the videos. And it came up in you know, traditional Hawaiian, gave me the big hug, a kiss on both cheeks. And she said, I'm so sorry, your university is so screwed up. And <laughs> I had to laugh. It's like, well, it's interesting that uh, you haven't quite put together that we're actually talking about your campus. But nonetheless, it did make it relevant to them. And uh, this is, if you're interested in looking at the presentation later, um, this is a YouTube clip that you can actually click on and you will see the uh, there we go. <laughs> You'll actually see the video and get to hear how those work and whatnot. Brief videos where basically I introduce this issue and ask for their help. So 
what the teams have to do first is they have to propose a solution to this problem. Um, now we do use the setting in forums where the students have to post before they can read other people's postings. And what each student on the team must do each student on the team has to propose some sort of social psychology intervention, and we always staged it with something that they were learning about at that time, that could be used to um, help address, address the issue that's happening at Patrick's University. Now, after they post their initial post, their initial recommendation, then the students get to basically collaborate together as a team to come up with um, basically uh, one consolidated recommendation as a team. So this initial recommendation that the team agrees on is graded. It is one of the aspects that's graded and it's due in the middle of the week. And to kind of zoom in here and show you a little bit of that interaction, uh, this is the initial post that I showed you just a moment ago. And then these are the students responding to that initial post. And they're working together. They're trying to augment the suggestions. They're trying to come together and form that one consolidated recommendation for how to help Patrick at his university. Um, so once they do that collaboration, by the middle of the week, they post uh, basically a, a consolidated recommendation for Patrick. So that was that step. Now for the rest of the week, things change up. Now the consultation begins. Um, each student at that point, once they have once the teams have um, submitted their initial recommendations, the teams become individuals. And individual students can act as consultants to the other team. So the students can go out to the other teams, they get to read their presentation, so they read their recommendations, and the students comment on the other team's recommendations as a consultant, giving constructive criticism for perhaps how to make uh, that recommendation better. Now we do have the rule within this game that each team has to have at least two outside consultants in order to get full credit. This is one way that we could help you know, motivate and make sure we're meet, meeting some minimums. So um, the teams really did need to get at least two people. We never had a problem with that minimum. As a matter of fact, if I zoom into this next screenshot, uh, you'll see here, so this is the uh, consolidated recommendation that I showed you just a moment ago. And what you see under here are teams, or sorry, uh, students from other teams acting as consultants coming in and giving feedback on this uh, recommendation. So, you know, this person's telling them, uh, you know, I, I love the design, but uh, this person actually said she couldn't think of anything else. Um, but you do get some really great feedback and some really interesting ideas being uh, generated down here. So I just kind of screen, screen down through this. You'll see lots and lots. I love this one that, you know, food. Food is the best motivator. Uh, so give them Simon and Pizza Pockets and Spam Musubi, of course. That'll get anybody to show up for orientation. Um, so, yeah, they are really helping one another out out and this kind of gets into that motivation level of being able to and this again Alex can speak to better than mine um, but kind of that sort of the level of altruism of being able to help someone out um, on the gamer side you know a lot of times we call this our healer effect where um, team support is something that actually uh, motivates a lot of gamers you know being able to support your team and help people out so we saw a lot uh, more engagement from this so after that uh, period of consultation, by the end of the week, the consultation period ends and then the teams have to provide their final recommendation. And that final recommendation must include a copy of the initial recommendation, all the people who consulted with them, their names, the suggestions that they considered, and then the final agreed upon recommendation. And if I zoom into this screenshot, we were bowled away with the level of detail that students put into this. Because again, they're doing this to help Patrick. They're doing this to help this character that they've met uh, try to overcome these obstacles that he's experiencing at his university. So you see here the initial recommendation, and then uh, basically, um, kind of a summary of all the different recommendations that were made to them by their classmate consultants from other teams. Toward the bottom here, as I say, eight consultants for that team. Uh, toward the bottom, how our team addressed the suggestions. 
and then the final recommendation. And remember what I said earlier about you know making things not just opinion based, but having them based on on actual data, on research, on theory. Um, the students actually included here. Uh, the types of social psychology or the interventions that they were recommend recommending. So the norm of reciprocity, for example, is something that they were studying at that time. Uh, positive reinforcement was something that they were studying at that time. So you see this uh, very, very detailed recommendation that they were basically submitting to Patrick to you know, help him sort of across this hurdle. Okay, so now one thing that I want to point out, oh, sorry, forgot about this one. So like I said, we did want to give at least one competitive challenge. So uh, there were six consultation assignments, so six discussions during this course. Four of them were of the collaborative nature, like I was just showing you, but two of them were what we called all team challenges. So on the all team challenges, no consultation took place between teams. Everything happened internally within the team and the teams competed to propose the best suggested intervention for Patrick. Um, and there were bonuses awarded for full team participation to make sure everyone participated participated or get them motivated to participate. Uh, but this one was competitive, so they had to work just with their team to come up with the best proposal. So one thing that I want to point out at this point that's important um, is the question of what is graded. So really, there are only two things that are receiving a grade. The team's initial recommendation that we said was posted midweek and the team's final recommendation that was posted at the end of the week. That whole part in the middle about consulting and going into other teams and providing feedback for them, that does not get points. That is not graded. And at first you might think, well, that sounds kind of crazy if you want to increase participation. But what we wanted to do was sort of look at this at a different point of view of just sort of putting a grade on it. And we came up with what we called SOSI points. So SOSI points became our way to try to motivate the students to be a consultant for their classmates. If I zoom in here, what you'll see, and this is tied to achievements, um, what we set up was that each time a student were to go into another team's um, recommendation and make a substantial contribution, make a substantial recommendation for improvement, they would earn one SOSI point. And those points would accrue over the semester. And you can see here the different achievements that we set up that uh, six SOSI points, they would get five points on exam one at nine SOSI points, so forth and so on, all the way up to 15 SOSI points where they would get uh, plus three for their entire team. Again, kind of motivating out to those team support folks um, on their team project that happened at the end of the course. Now, there were a few uh, additional rules. Uh, like we said earlier, uh, each team needed to have at least two classmates consult on each consultation assignment. So on each discussion, they needed to have at least two. Again, we never had a problem with that. But we did give them the warning that you can lose SOSI points. Uh, the class really, and there is a social psychology uh, tenant that goes with this that Alex can tell you about that I can't. <laughs> um, Oh, I used to know that. Um, there's uh, basically the entire community has to work together to make sure that no one fails. Um, if a week went by where any team got less than two consultants, then the entire class would lose two SOSI points. Like I said, we never ex had that happen. We always had many, many more than the minimum that we needed. So uh, we tracked the SOSI points uh, using basically a, a simple web pages, web content page. Um, and what we did was basically create a progress bar. This was from our proof of concept course, the first time the course ran. And you can see here we had a decent level of participation, one student earning all the achievements possible and several students earning at least the first level of achievement. Um, now, it's important for me to note that the way that I balance this uh, basically for a student to even achieve that first level achievement, which in this course was 10 SOSI points, um, 
in, in order for them to achieve the minimum there, the 10, students would have to participate more often than the minimum that Alex had set in the previous version of the course. So any student that you see here that has any achievement next to their name, they are going over and above the minimum that Alex had set for the previous design of the course. Um, so when you look at it from that point of view, you really start to see that these students were highly, highly engaged uh, in these discussions. Oh, I hear a voice. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, so I have some screen grabs from uh, subsequent runs of the course and the most recent run of the course here, uh, again, with the 45 students, you see a large number of students earning achievements, um, some of them getting that full participation. You do see a few that have zero, but most uh, are engaged in, in some level and most are highly engaged. So that was kind of our, uh, our gamified way of uh, trying to help that along. So what we saw is uh, when we're looking at the quality and the quantity of student interactions were that students were interacting in a much more meaningful way. They were interacting more frequently, they were interacting more thoughtfully and more constructively. So in the original design of the course, what I showed you earlier, the average forum had on average uh, 25.14 posts, so about 25 posts per forum throughout the course. The average number of posts per student, including the initial response, was about 2.29. In the experimental design that we tried, the average forum went up to 66, almost 67 student posts. Um, average number of posts per students, about well, five and a half. This was an increase of 143% participation. And really striking about that number when you think about the fact that we took away the grade associated with participation. There was no grade for participation. It was simply motivated by uh, earning SOSI points and basically helping classmates. So we were extremely, extremely pleased with the results that we got. Um, to kind of show you an example, from the proof of concept course, uh, you know, what we saw before was, you know, in the 20s and 30s, here we have, you know, 74 messages, 69, 57, um, you know, high levels of engagement. And here I wanted to show you that in week two, for one of the later runs of the course, you know, we see 26, 50, 13. And if I skip all the way down to week 11, where in the previous design of the course, he was down to very, very minimal participation. You see that students are still engaged. Even at the end of the course, students are still working. They're still working with one another. They're still coming up um, with you know, ways to be able to, to help out this character that they've met in this game. Uh, hey, Patrick, um, yes. I don't mean to cut you off, but I do want to jump in just really quickly because oh, we're yeah. getting close to the end of the we hour here. We have had a lot of really great discussion in the chat. A lot of people have been really excited about it. We did have a couple of questions that I just wanted to kind of run past you here quickly Absolutely. and see if maybe other people might have some questions as well. Uh, one question that we had from Terry was just if you could confirm that the students stay in the same groups throughout the entire course. Were they in yes, the same they group did. throughout the whole course? Okay. Yes, they did. Yeah, we found that especially when we give them that team charter assignment and let them as a team come up with their team norms and their, their way of functioning and whatnot, once they have achieved that, we really want to keep them in uh, those teams, especially because these teams were also working on a team project together. So it wasn't just the discussion, they were also working on a project with a deliverable. Gotcha. We also had uh, some questions and some discussion about whether or not you ultimately told the students that the things that they were working on were really not accurate, that they were fictional. Um, you know, you had students that came up to you and saw you on campus and wanted to console you about things that, that were happening at your institution. Did you guys ever tell them that, you know, this scenario was actually a, a fictional one or a contrived one? That is a good question, and I left that up to Alex since you know, they were his students and it was his university, and he chose not to tell them that. He did, however, start to draw the lines of comparison between uh, the issues that I was saying were happening at my university and the issues that were happening at his university. Um, there's, a, there's a really kind of a fun story that I'll tell very, very quickly. Um, 
you know, if you've ever been to Hawaii before, you might know that there there is a cultural clash between you know the native Hawaiian culture and the the outsider culture, what they call Haoles, basically uh, you know foreigners that have come to Hawaii, and um, th there is a good bit of um, uh, sort of I, I guess cultural clash is the way that you can put it there. Um, so he wanted to address that in, in this course, and uh, what we came up with for me to say happening was uh, basically, you know, here at Texas State, most of our students uh, for a long time have been Texans, born and raised and bred Texans who are very proud of their Texas heritage and their Texas culture and their Texas way of thinking. And then all of a sudden, now we have all these Californians coming in and these Californians are bringing their California way of thinking and their California culture and trying to impose that on the Texans. And <laughs> uh, that was our way of kind of bringing that through. And it was really interesting that he said, you know, a lot of the students there, he he did you know draw that comparison for them, and it turned into a really interesting discussion of uh, you, know, you know what they're seeing on their campus versus what I was seeing on mine. That's really really cool. Uh, thank you. Also, we did have uh, some questions about the leaderboard and about <laughs> you know, using that as a motivational tool, and there were some people who expressed some mild concerns uh, related to students being able to see one another's participation and one another's scores. Did you guys feel any concerns about allowing all of the students to see how they stacked up with one another? Well, we did look at the research on leaderboards, and you know, what we found on leaderboards was that leaderboards can be demotivating if you see, uh, you know, basically everyone's performance and see that you are, you know, so far behind what we consider to be the true leaders in this. Um, and in a previous design that we uh, worked on with him, the way that we addressed that was we would only show uh, the top five students, and we wouldn't show everyone else's relation to that. However, in the SOSI scores, we're not showing scores. It has nothing to do with grade. It just has to do with progression. Um, so we didn't worry about any FERPA violations or anything like that because we're not showing anyone's grade or any types of points that have been earned. It's just the level of progression in this game that's going on. Um, and by doing that, since it was really self-selected, there was no requirement students could choose whether they wanted to act as a consultant or not. That was, they were given the autonomy to choose that. Uh, we didn't worry about that so much, actually. And you know, what we found was that the students who were interested in being able to see their achievements and you know have that visual confirmation, it was motivating for them because they liked that. Uh, we didn't have any students, and the survey results are in the presentation, which uh, you can take a look at. I know we're out of time here. Um, but, but we didn't have any students give any type of negative comments about the leaderboard. So uh, that made us feel okay about the design that we chose for that. That's great. Thank you. Well, we are a little over time here. Yeah. I see that it's 11.02 now. But thank you, Patrick, so much for this. This has been just a really great presentation. And well, when you take a look you. in the chat, once you stop sharing your screen, I think you'll see just how excited everybody was to see what you guys did and just to see the quantifiable results, the huge increase in number of posts and in participation. I mean, what you guys did was was really, really great, was really, really inspiring to me. It's something that I'm going to start thinking about for my school, and I know a lot of other people are going to do the same. So thank you so much for taking some time well, to share it with us. Thank you all so much for having me. Sorry that I talked so long, but like I said, I am apt to do so. <laughs> I did put the link to the presentation there in the chat. So if you do want to go in, like I had, like I said, we have our survey results there. If you want to see the data from uh, you know, what our students told us and um, any of those media, media clips as well, you can uh, see everything within that link. And again, I appreciate you having me, and um, it was a pleasure being here. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, one more thing, if you would be willing to answer questions, if people want to reach out to you specifically, maybe oh, email you with questions absolutely. about what they did, would you mind pasting your email address there in the chat so that people can see it? There you go. Absolutely. I would be more than happy to, you know, brainstorm with anyone about this idea. I've been really interested in, you know, game-based learning and gamification for a while now, and this was really our second major project to do. So I'm continuing, uh, you're looking at that research. So I'm more than happy to talk.
That's awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick, for everything. And thank you guys for taking time out of your busy weekday schedule to join us this morning. We will see you all right back here in two weeks uh, on Wednesday, October the 19th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And Shauna Ryan from Providence College is going to be giving a presentation on live polling in Sakai and Providence's experiences and feedback from live polling with Sakai. So again, thank you all so much, and we will see you right back here in two weeks.